So I want to read our text for this morning. Um, we're still in the book of Romans, and like I told you a couple of weeks ago, we're going to be reading Romans backwards. We're following uh, Scott McKnight, who wrote a book called Reading Romans Backwards. We're following his guide, um, where he uh, really challenges us to think about Romans starting from the end and working our way to the beginning, and that will help us understand all that theology at the beginning of the book if we understand the context and what was going on in the community that's talked about at the end of Romans. So today we're going to be reading Romans 12. A friend of mine, Justin Rohr, is a pastor at Restoration, another church not too far from here, and he's in Romans right now, and I found out recently he's spending the whole summer just on Romans chapter 8, just one chapter. And I I was like, dude, what? That's crazy. And I was like, I'm trying to do all of Romans in like seven weeks, you know. So uh, we're taking very different approaches. Uh, So you can go check out his sermon series and see how he tackles Romans 8. But we're we're moving along. We're already in Romans 12, and we started at 16. So we're going to be picking up some speed, and we'll get all the way to the beginning uh, eventually by the end of this month. So I'm going to read our our text. We're going to actually read a text from Romans chapter 8 and Romans chapter 12. So Paul says, For those God foreknew, he also predestined to be conformed to the image of his Son, that he might be the firstborn among many brothers and sisters. I'm honing in on that phrase, to be conformed to the image of his Son. Romans 12, 1 through 2, Therefore I urge you, brothers and sisters, in view of God's mercy, to offer your bodies as a living sacrifice, holy and pleasing to God. This is your true and proper worship. Do not conform to the pattern of this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind. Then you will be able to test and approve what God's will is, His good, pleasing, and perfect will. So when we began our series on Romans just a few weeks ago, I told you all that I had some history with Romans. And some of y'all nodded and said, I got some history with Romans too. Some of it might be a wonderful history and some of it might be a little bit harder history uh, that you have with Romans. I specifically shared about an experience I had when I was an altar minister at Igthus Music Festival. Didn't know what I was getting myself into. Guy came forward after the message by Louis Giglio and he wanted to give his life to Jesus. He wanted to live with purpose and meaning in his life. And I opened up the Bible to Romans and tried to walk him down the Romans road to salvation. And this young man was searching for a gospel that had power for this life. And all I did was offer him a gospel that assured him of an afterlife. And I left that experience feeling discouraged and really embarrassed because what I shared with him did not connect with what he was searching for. I have more history with Romans. When I selected our text for preaching this week, my mind immediately went back to a few years ago when I was in college. Um, I was volunteering at my old youth group. I grew up at a church here in town, Centenary, and I grew up in their youth group. And my, my main youth pastor that I had most of that time was a guy named Ryan Young. And, and I, I'd grown up in that youth group. And when I was in college, I was here in Lexington for a few months for a semester of college. And I got involved just helping out with the youth group a little bit. And the youth pastor, Ryan Young, uh, I told you about, invited me to go on a mission trip with this group to Costa Rica as a leader. Now, I'd been on trips to Costa Rica with Sittner's youth group as just a participant. um, But this time, he's like, John, I I want you to come as a leader. And we'll pay for your trip. And you can help us out and kind of do your thing. And I was like, yeah, I get to be a leader. That sounds really cool. And I loved Costa Rica, and so I was really excited to go back um, on that trip. And he told me beforehand, he said, the very first night we get there, we're going to go to the airport, we're getting on vans, and we're going to drive a pretty long drive to a church in this village we're staying in, and they're going to have a worship service. It's the first thing we're doing, and they want someone from our group to preach at this worship service. And he said, John, I want to know if you are interested in preaching the sermon at this worship service. And I'd never really preached a lot when, at that point in my life. I'd done a couple of little testimonies here and there. Um, but, you know, I was nervous about it, but I was actually excited. I was like, oh, I get the opportunity to preach. That sounds cool, you know. And, um, and, and just a side note, my, my youth leaders were so intentional about giving me chances to do stuff like that, and I'm just so grateful for them. 
Um, but I was nervous, but I was really excited um, at the same time. Now, he told me about this, and, and I asked him, I said, now, I don't really know what to preach on. Can you tell me, like, some examples, a text maybe in Scripture that I could use? And he, he told me, he's like, well, here's a text I think you could preach on. How about Romans chapter 12, verses 1 and 2, which was the second Scripture I just read for you all. Now, I was like, all right, sounds good. Now, something to know about me, uh, when I was in college, I was a procrastinator. I put things off. Do y'all, anybody a procrastinator in the room? Uh, I was really good at putting things off. I would, I would usually get done what I needed to get done, uh, but it was often at the very last minute and not the highest of quality, uh, because when you put things off till the end, it's usually not your best work. I've learned. I don't do that as much today, um, particularly uh, with preaching, but um, what, what I often do, if it's something I think will be hard or something I don't feel very good about or something I don't want to do, I'm really good at putting that off until I, the very last minute. So I read the text, uh, Romans chapter 12, 1 and 2, that he told me about, and I was like, this ain't speaking to me at all. I was like, I have no idea what to say about these verses. I don't understand even what Paul is talking about here. And so I just put off writing the sermon. I said, I'll get to it eventually. And I put it off. And I put it off. I didn't write it before we even left for the trip. I didn't write it on the plane ride on the way to Costa Rica. We got to the airport, had a little bit of time there as we were waiting for the van. Didn't work on it then. I waited until the van ride from the airport to the church to try to figure out what I was going to preach. Now, I was not a good preacher, and so that's not something I should have done. Um, it was a long ride, but it was certainly not long enough to figure out how I was going to preach this sermon. I think I was in the back, like, asking, like, the youth. I was like, hey, what do y'all think about this text? <laughs> Trying to figure out, like, what I'm going to do. Now, I got up when we got to that church, and I preached the worst sermon I've ever preached uh, by far. I blocked it out of my mind. I have no idea what I said. Um, but I do remember how I felt about that sermon, and I felt very terrible about that message I gave. Um, there's a picture here. That's me uh, preaching that sermon. I don't look very happy. If you can see, I'm like, look really nervous, you know, I'm not even looking up at the people. It's probably how I did it most of the time. But the other man there was named Carlos, and fortunately I had an interpreter. And almost everybody that wasn't part of our group spoke Spanish, and didn't un they didn't know English. And so they couldn't hear what I was saying. And so my interpreter, Carlos, he said to me afterwards, he patted me on my back, he said, don't worry, John. He's like, I didn't tell him what you said. <laughs> so... I gathered that he preached a totally different sermon, and he's that good, where he was just coming up with stuff in the silent, and when I was saying, and he was saying something different in Spanish. Now, I'm sure Carlos preached uh, a better sermon than I did. <laughs> this past week, I've spent a good amount of time reflecting on that text that I preached uh, many years ago in Costa Rica. I want to read it for you one more time. Paul says, therefore, I urge you, I urge you, brothers and sisters, in view of God's mercy, and he's really saying in view of all this stuff I've told you in chapters 1 through 11, heard a, there's a cheesy phrase that seminary professors use. They say, if you see a therefore, ask why is it therefore? <laughs> um, and, and so therefore, he's talking about all that's come before, and now it's, a, it's really a hinge, a, a point in Romans where things shift. He's like, in view of all God's mercy, all the things I've shared with you, here's what you need to do. Offer your bodies as a living sacrifice, holy and pleasing to God. This is your true and proper worship. Do not conform to the pattern of this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind. Then you will be able to test and approve what God's will is, His good, pleasing, and perfect will. I've come to love these verses, actually, and they've become very important to me in my life. And one thing, I've, as I've reflected on Carlos and that experience in Costa Rica, I've come to see that Carlos, he preached Romans 12 better than me, not because of his words, but because Carlos actually lived out Romans 12. Carlos has been a good friend of mine for a long time, actually. I met him in Costa Rica. He's a Costa Rican man who was a missionary to his own people there in Costa Rica. He's become a good friend of mine, and he's been a mentor to me over many, many years. And we don't get to talk a lot um, anymore, but he is someone in my life who really pointed me to Jesus. 
more than probably most people in my life. And it's not because of eloquent, eloquent words. It's not because of charisma. It's not because of he's got this like special talent or anything. He, it's because he reminds me of Jesus by the way he lives his life. I see the scriptures come alive in him. He embodies Jesus for me. In other words, I see Jesus in him. Do you all have people like that in your life where you look at them and they remind you of Jesus? I believe this is what this text is all about. And really what Romans is all about. Offering your body is about giving yourself fully to God. It's giving yourself fully to God to become more and more like Jesus. Romans 8.29 reads, For God, for those God foreknew, He also predestined to be conformed to the image of His Son, that He might be the firstborn among many brothers and sisters. Now, I'm not going to get into the whole predestination argument today. We'll save that for a, a later sermon this month. But I do want to focus on the fact that God's chosen people are meant to be conformed to the image of Jesus. To conform is to become like something. It's to become similar. When I was a teenager, I found that I conformed to the people that I looked up to. It's just like teenagers are always conforming to their group and to their people, right? Because like they're trying to figure themselves out. And, and to conform means to become similar, to become like. Paul argues that God's people are to conform to the image of Jesus, to become like Jesus, to be formed and shaped by Jesus to such a degree that we start looking like him. We talk like Jesus. We walk like Jesus. We treat other people like Jesus. We see the world like Jesus. We listen to people like Jesus. We think like Jesus. We love like Jesus. Scott McKnight argues that the whole point of Romans is what he calls Christoformity. Now, Christians like to make up words like this sometimes. It's a, a silly word, but it essentially means that we are formed and shaped to look like Christ. That we become more like Jesus through the power of the Holy Spirit working in us. Sometimes when I pray on Sundays, I I say my prayer is that we leave here looking more like Jesus. This is Christoformity. And this is what I believe is Paul's purpose in writing Romans. He wants the Christians in Rome to look like Jesus. To be conformed to the image of Jesus. When I think of Carlos, I think of Jesus. And that's because Carlos embodies the life of Jesus by the way he lives. He's been so formed by sh and shaped by Jesus that he started looking like him. In Romans 12, 2, Paul warns the Christians in Rome. He says, do not conform to the pattern of this world. And so he had laid out in Romans 8, just a few chapters before, that we are to conform to the image of Jesus. And then he warns them in chapter 12, don't conform to the patterns of this world. Perhaps he understood what Bob Dylan understood in his song where he says, you've got to serve somebody. Whether we know it or not, we're serving somebody. We are being formed and shaped all the time by powerful forces. And these forces are often destructive and leading us to be uh, people that maybe we're not meant to be, that's not fully healthy for us. Paul was writing to Christians in the center of the Roman Empire. And Rome was good at seeking to conform its people to be the ideal Romans. All empires do this really well. They have lots of ways to help shape and form us into the people that they want us to be. And so the way Rome shaped people was often very different from the way Jesus wanted to shape people. For example, just one example that we've talked about here. Through Rome's philosophers and media and propaganda, Rome taught that there was this hierarchy in society, that some people were more important than others. Even in the household, there was a hierarchy, and you were supposed to live into this in order to be an ideal Roman citizen. Yet Jesus came in claiming, no, 
God actually intends to abolish all those hierarchies and everybody is equal in the eyes of God. And so the Roman kind of way they wanted to shape people was very different than how Jesus was seeking to shape people. This week, many will celebrate Independence Day in the United States. And through parades and speeches and events and concerts and gatherings, America is going to tell a version of its story that says a lot of things. And some of it is true and some of it is a bit of a stretch. One thing in particular that we're going to share is that God shows special favor to this country. That our country is the greatest in all the world. That we value equality and justice above everybody else. And these holidays often are meant to shape and form us into ideal Americans. So much so uh, that, that, that we, we often just accept it blindly. And we're just conformed to the patterns of this world instead of being conformed to the way of Jesus. And it's just one small example. So my question for us to think about is, what is forming and shaping you? It's often a hard thing to answer, right? Because we're formed and shaped in very subtle ways over very long periods of time. And I think first we've got to acknowledge that it's happening. That we are being formed and shaped and impacted by forces all around us at all times. And these are often forces that are destructive and manipulative and not designed to bring wholeness and peace to our lives and to the world. And so what is forming and shaping you? Some questions I've had to ask myself over the last few years, and maybe you do as well. What media do you consume? What voices are you listening to? How do you spend your time? Who are your mentors? What books do you read? How do you spend your money? Who do you talk to? Uh, who do you spend time with? Who are your friends? What do you do on your smartphone? What shows are you consuming? All of these things and so much more forms and shapes us and molds us. And all of this is not bad. You know, often like it's easy for Christians to talk about the boogeyman out there, the world, you know, and the culture and be scared of all this stuff. You know, I don't think we have to be afraid. The world has a lot of beauty and wonderful things in it. God created the world, right? And there's so much wonderful stuff all around us and so many ideas and thoughts that can help us in our lives. In other places in Scripture, Paul argues that we should really be sifters of the things of this world. He says, whatever's good and noble and praiseworthy and excellent, think on these things, right? And, and those things don't always come from Scripture. We can find God's presence and beauty all around us. But we have to be sifters of the things of this world. We have to discern what is helpful and keep it. And what is harmful, we, we discard it. And this is, we have to be critical thinkers about this stuff. And we've got to look at all of it. Is this practice or this item or this relationship or this group or this thing helping me become more like Jesus? Or is it leading me somewhere else. Let's go back to 2020 just for a moment. Say 2020, we probably was like jump back. I think this will happen forever, right? It was like a monumental year for us. The pandemic hit us. We had racial uprisings all across the world. A volatile presidential election, massive division, and even hatred. And, and as I was home a lot during the pandemic, as many of you all were as well, I found myself on my phone more, scrolling through social media, Twitter and Facebook and all other things. And, and I found that the more I scrolled, the more anger I felt at other people. The more I scrolled, the easier it was to demonize people. The more I scrolled, the closer I got to hatred. I stopped liking people that were once my friends. And I needed some of that information I was consuming, but I don't think I was being careful enough. And I allowed that vitriol and that hatred and that anger to impact me. I was being shaped and formed and conforming, really, I believe, to the patterns of this world. And I didn't even realize it when it was happening. There were Christians, even, I had to stop following. and say, I'm not going to read this stuff anymore because they didn't remind me of Jesus at all. Some of them were claiming Jesus' name and a fight for justice, but didn't remind me at all of the Jesus that I encounter in the Gospels. We are all being formed and shaped 
by so many powerful forces all around us. And Paul is challenging us, I believe, to consider all of it and ask the question, does this help me look more like Jesus? My wife got me a new Bible for my birthday, and funny gift for a pastor because I got a lot of Bibles, but she knows that I would have liked this Bible because I'd never seen this Bible. Um, I think Pastor Tanya might have this Bible or has read it before, but it's, it's called the First Nations Version. It's an indigenous translation of the New Testament. And it's written from the perspective of indigenous folks who were already here in America before uh, we claimed to settle this country and discover this place. And, and I love this version because it, it's beautiful, many of the ways that they translate the scriptures. And I love how this Bible translates Romans 12, verse 2. It says, do not permit the ways of this world to mold and shape you. Instead, let Creator change you from the inside out. In the way a caterpillar becomes a butterfly. He will do this by giving you a new way of thinking and seeing and walking. Then you will know for sure what the great spirit wants for you. Things that are good. That make the heart glad. And that help you walk the path of becoming a mature and true human being. You know, I see Paul's goal with these Christians in Rome like this. He wanted them to walk that path of becoming mature and true humans. And who did Paul believe was the most mature and true human ever to walk the earth? It was the person Paul gave his life to follow, Jesus of Nazareth. So Jesus is the model. Jesus is the one we seek. Jesus is the one we embody, that we imitate as we live together in community in this beautiful and difficult world. So some questions that you can begin just to think about in your own life. What is shaping and forming you? Are there things that you might want to cut out of your life? What do you need to add into your life? Are you spending time cultivating that friendship with Jesus so that you get to know Jesus more and know Jesus' heart and be transformed from the inside out? You know, I love how Romans 12 ends. It's, it's some of the most powerful scripture, and, and I gave you all, most of you, unless you came in late, uh, cards that have these verses on them. But if you want to know what a life conformed to the image of Jesus looks like, it's ultimately a life of love. And it's a life of love for God, a love for others, and a love for ourselves. Jesus taught this. He said that all the commandments, everything can be summed up like this, love God and love your neighbor as you love yourself. The entire New Testament is, is in agreement on this. Like, I believe this. I've studied the New Testament. It agrees from the beginning of the New Testament to the end. And really, the Hebrew Bible, the Old Testament, agrees on this fundamental idea as well. That to be a Christian, to follow God, to love God, is to be a person who is full of love. Romans 12, 9 through 21 gives 29 different instructions. And the heading in the NRSV on this section, these headings were added later. They weren't a part of the original Greek text, but they try to sum up these different sections to make it easier to track as you're reading through the Bible. But the NRSV folks, they, they labeled this section marks of the true Christian. And the NIV labels this section as love in action. And I think they go hand in hand because I think the true Christian is the one who loves Jesus and puts that into action in the way they live their lives. They love like Jesus. And so I'm going to close just by reading these verses for you. And you can follow along on those cards, but I want you to picture Jesus if you want. Why? I mean, we don't know what Jesus looked like, and so you can picture uh, Something that comes to your mind that reminds you of Jesus. But these verses are instructions for us. But ultimately, I can read through these and just plug in Jesus' name in front of all this stuff. And this is really what Jesus did. These are descriptions of how Jesus lived in this world. This is how he lived. And therefore, this is how we live. So I encourage you also to take these uh, words home with you. And I want you to read them often. And think about how you are embodying these verses, how you are actually living them out in your families, in your workplace, in your church community, in your school, in your friend groups. 
You know, sometimes it's a great question. I've been asked this recently, and I've been thinking about this recently. We talk a lot about loving others, but what does that really mean? You know, it's one thing to say uh, we need to love, but, like, what does it mean to love? We all have very different definitions and understandings of what love looks like. And I think this is a wonderful place to start. And I think Paul understood that love is complex and it's big and there's a lot of layers to it. And so Paul gave the Romans 29 different ways they could try to practice love in their house churches, in their communities, in the way they live publicly in the world right here in Romans. And so I think this is a wonderful place to start. If you don't know what it means to love somebody um, and and think through this, are you seeking to live these things out in your day-to-day life? And so let me read these for us. And then after that, we'll enter into a time of communion. Love must be sincere. This is how he starts this section. Hate what is evil and cling to what is good. Be devoted to one another in love. Honor one another above yourselves. Never be lacking in zeal, but keep your spiritual fervor. Serving the Lord. Be joyful in hope, patient in affliction, and faithful in prayer. Share with the Lord's people who are in need. Practice hospitality. Bless those who persecute you. Bless and do not curse. Rejoice with those who rejoice and mourn with those who mourn. Live in harmony with one another. Do not be proud, but be willing to associate with people of low position. Do not be conceited. Do not repay anyone evil for evil. Be careful to do what is right in the eyes of everyone. If it is possible, as far as it depends on you, live at peace with everyone. Do not take revenge, my dear friends, but leave room for God's wrath. For it is written, it is mine to avenge. I will repay, says the Lord. On the contrary, if your enemy is hungry, feed him. If he is thirsty, give him something to drink. In doing this, you will heap burning coals on his head. Do not become overcome by evil, but overcome evil with good. In the name of the Father, Son, Holy Spirit, amen.